Hello and welcome to a special edition of Spokane Talks. We're talking about politics today, and we're talking about the 4th District position number one representative seat, which is, of course, going to be uh, up for grabs on the 4th of August at the uh, primary election date. We have two of the candidates who are with us today, who are able to make it uh, with us today. One is the incumbent, uh, Representative Bob McCaslin. Is a familiar name, obviously, to folks around here. His father was also in the state government for a number of years. And Mike Conrad, a businessman and business developer from the Spokane Valley. Now, let me just give you, oh, by the way, I'm Mike Fitzsimmons. Uh, there's a, a, a way in which we're going to do this. We're going to be asking questions from six categories. One is the economy. One is taxation and, fed, and uh, fiscal policy. Another, law and order policy coronavirus and public health and protection policy. And we're also going to be talking about uh, one or two other areas, and that includes growth management and public education, okay? I've got some questions in each of these categories. We're going to be going for approximately 45 minutes, and we therefore aren't going to get to all of the questions, but I'm not going to ask a second question in any one of the categories to somebody who has already answered. The way the process goes is the person who's asked the first question is going to have a minute uh, to, after you, of course, introduce yourselves and explain a little bit about yourselves, have an opportunity to answer the question. The other candidate then will have an opportunity to follow up and either criticize or, uh, or um, in some ways or other, uh, state their own positions on that. The candidate who initiated that part portion of the round will then have the opportunity to have a summation and we will move to the next round, okay? okay. So we're gonna be a little loose on the time. This is a discussion, this is not a rigid debate. The whole idea is we're trying to acquaint you, the audience, with the issues and with the candidates' positions on those issues. So. By agreement, uh, Mike is the one we will start with. Mike Conrad, tell us a little bit about yourself. So my name is Mike Conrad. I'm uh, from Spokane, Washington. I went to University High School. I graduated in 1988. Um, I went on an LDS mission in 1989 to Brazil, learned a little Portuguese, uh, got back in 91, went to um, BYU-Idaho for about a year and a half, and then my brother asked me to come out to um, Chicago to work with him and he had a small business and I started uh, that's where my small business life started um, and I never looked back so I've done business for the last 30 years I've done it in pretty much every state uh, not just in uh, Washington and um, right now I uh, I'm the CEO of a company called the Savory Butcher and I sell uh, food to families in bulk uh, and I've been doing that for about 10 years. All right, sir. Bob McCaslin, a little bit about you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mike. Well, uh, I grew up, was born here in Spokane and uh, grew up here. I uh, graduated from Central Valley High School in 1976 and from there went on to WSU where I got an elementary education degree. And my first job was substitute teaching in Pullman and Moscow and then I moved to San Jose California in uh, the summer of 1983 and taught there for 11 years met my wife there we moved back to Spokane in 1994 and I taught in the Central Valley School District for 20 years there and most of that time teaching was kindergarten and so uh, my wife jokes that my skills as a kindergarten teacher work really well in the legislature because we deal with the same behaviors often. And I wish that weren't true, but it is sometimes. And I've had the joy of being able to represent the 4th District for the last six years. And uh, I'm the assistant ranking member on the Early Learning and Human Services Committee and also the Education Committee. And I just spent the last two years on the transportation committee which has been really a wonderful experience for me a uh, great learning experience so i counted a privilege to represent the fourth district and i consider my constituents my bosses and i try to listen to very very carefully to what their concerns are 
and act upon those concerns. All right. All of us, I'm sure, can agree on one thing before we get into this. This is going to be one of the most interesting se uh, sessions ever upcoming this coming January in light of the fact that we are coming out of, perhaps by that time, maybe not, the coronavirus effects, but virtually everything the state uh, is about has been affected in some way, shape, or form by that. So some of the questions are going to reflect those sorts of things. And since, Mike, you were to le the lead off, let me ask you this one. One of the legislative challenges in the coming months and years is going to be to find ways to rebuild the state's economy in the wake of this coronavirus uh, uh, crisis. So what recommendations will you seek to persuade fellow lawmakers to adopt in order to do that? What do you see? So I think there's been an overreaction myself. I feel that, uh, that coronavirus has been a, a serious issue, but I also think that the reaction to it has been uh, overrated a little bit. Um, I think that the shutdown has been uh, a serious problem for a lot of businesses, especially small businesses, and especially in the service industry. You know, these people are trying to survive you think about people who uh, are waiters and and live day to day and they have no uh, way to be able to make money so to me the deficit you know at the same time the state is not being able to collect tax on that because there's nothing happening so for me the number one thing is to be able to get the economy back going uh, you know we had an amazing economy going prior to uh, coronavirus and I believe that we can get back to that but the reality is we have to open it up, up the uh, the uh, the economy again because it's basically been closed. And for me, um, you have to uh, give people their freedom back to choose. You know uh, what is it? The left always says it's uh, 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 my body, my choice. <laughs> it's kind of the same. Our my body, my choice. People should have the opportunity to be able to have the freedom to be able to go and eat out if they want to, or be able to and make that choice. It's their freedom. They know what the dangers are. They know what could be, might happen. But for me, to be able to get kickstart the economy, you have to start opening up businesses, and you start have to start helping these people who have been devastated because of the coronavirus to be able to take that free enterprise and start back up, because that is what's going to help with the economy. That's what's going to be able to create the taxes is people who are excited and who have a dream and be able to implement their dream in this economy. So I think it's the free enterprise that's really going to help with it rather than legislating more laws or creating more uh you know uh, red tape it's really the people who are going to uh get this economy going again mr mccaslin your thoughts oh i i agree with mike the the thing that i'm seeing over and over again is the governor i think purposely has has used this whole uh pandemic as a as a as a personal power trip and i and i don't use that term lightly because he's with his procl proclamations he's tried to sow a sense of panic within the public and and some i, I i've met some of my constituents who are and i and i think most of my of of people in the fourth district are extremely upset because they've been infected either firsthand or secondhand or thirdhand by this by all of these uh, businesses that have been shut down. Uh, and it's not been arbitrary. It's been solely based on tax revenue. I think the governor has picked winners and losers based on tax revenue. And so when you consider a pot shop being an essential business, but your local contractor can't go and do his job at a construction site, that's a huge problem. and. Uh, I, my wife and I met a lady a couple months ago who was just about ready to go into a house, but the interior wasn't completely finished. And she asked me, uh, as we were walking our dogs, how she could somehow get, get her house because uh, she didn't have a place to live in the in, in the in between. And and I and I think. You know, when, when elected officials in general, in the majority, aren't thinking about that at all, they're thinking more about how can we get more money so that we can spend it, that, that causes a huge problem. And so 
that's kind of been the focus of, of what I've been looking at and working on, especially as I answer emails from constituents with their concerns. A closing observation on that topic, sir? Uh, I also agree that uh, Ensley is, uh, has overreacted on this, and I feel like, uh, you know, overall, um, the economy just needs to be open again. I, I, you know, we're five miles from Idaho border. I live five miles from the Idaho border, and when I go over there, it is amazing. It's a different world. You're not a criminal over there. Over there, you you have. <laughs> it feels like you have freedom. But here, it's yeah. if you're not wearing a mask, you're you're a bad guy. And I don't agree with that. And I, I I'm more about freedom and opportunity and the ability to be able to make your choice of what needs to happen. So. All right. A question for you. Uh Representative McCaslin, and on the light of what you were just discussing, should the Washington State Legislature have been called into session before now um, to address this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, particularly uh, to prevent the state's uh, response from being directed solely by uh, the governor? Should there be, a, should there have been an involvement of the legislature up until now? Well, that, that's really the only way that we could uh, affect this proclamation process. And, and I think uh, the other side of the aisle, there was an announcement by Pat Sullivan, uh, who's in leadership on the other side, that there would not be a, a uh, special session. And, and we've been, I, I've signed on, I think, to four different letters asking the governor to convene a special session. I don't think he really has anything to gain politically by doing that because he is riding this wave of panic that he's created himself. So I, I, I think, you know, and if we were in the majority, we definitely have a special session so we could deal with this. Uh, I'd like to applaud uh, State Treasurer Dwayne Davidson in his He's been very proactive talking to the governor's office and the lieutenant governor's office about keeping uh, the rainy the rainy day fund at at its maximum. We had we during the session we asked many times to do that and to prepare for any kind of emergency. And I think the legislature was doing that back in 2008 uh, when we had when we had the the Great Recession. And so. I, I don't think the other side of the aisle is very good at planning for the future. And uh, they care more about government agencies, government funding, and government having the answers to all of our problems, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. All right, Mike Conrad. So I don't think, I, I agree with Bob, actually. I think that the a special session, I, is it needed? If we were in power, yes, absolutely. But I think that because uh, uh, the Democrats are in power. I don't. I think it'd be a waste of time, <laughs> to be honest, because they're all going to fall in line with with Governor Ansley. They're going to do whatever he says. And so, uh, I, I should there have been? Yes, there should have been. But it would would it change anything? No, it wouldn't change anything because there's we have no power, which is a problem. So um, I, I just kind of feel like um, there's really a lot we can't do. <laughs> so that's my answer on that. Yeah. Okay, follow up. Oh, I, I think Mike hit on a on a really good point there. It's it's uh, I was really concerned about us going into a special session only because we didn't have the votes to be able to stop any bad policies that could have made things worse. The thing that that could have made a difference is that I know a lot of Democrats. I have friends on the other side of the aisle. They've been saying. Their constituents have been just heaping emails and telephone calls to their offices, all based on their business being able to be open or not open, their ability to work or not work. And uh, I think it was very purposeful on their part to not have a special session because uh, then the emergency could be even greater when we reconvene in, in, in January. And, they like, love emergencies. They love uh, creating a sen sense of panic when it comes to their programs. And I think for every job that's 
that every business that has to make cuts, a government agency should have to make the same cuts. I mean, that, that makes sense. Uh, I think our businesses are more important than our government agencies. This question to uh, you, Mike. Uh, given the economic damage done by the coronavirus, many families in Washington State today are not in a position to meet the uh, challenge of tuition costs for college come the fall. And those costs, that means, of course, that there's going to be revenue losses for the uh, higher education facilities, virtually all of them, colleges, universities, even community colleges. And that being the case then, uh, as a lawmaker, what would you be prepared to do about that? So there are a lot of opportunities for people with low income to be able to um, get grants. And, and uh, for example, um, in 2018, um, uh, I had a business that went under and we, we basically were decimated. And so my daughter just graduated from uh, uh, Central Valley High School and uh, because of that my income was low and I was able to apply for many different loans for my daughters um, uh, going to college so um, there are opportunities out there there are, there are grants there are loans that you can go get I don't think as a legislator um, we have um, the ability to be able to help uh, totally with people that need money to be able to go to college. Um, it is something that I think individuals uh, have to have that accountability to be able to figure that out. Uh, government isn't the answer for everything and if you want a higher education uh, and that's important to you then I think people need to figure that out uh, mostly by themselves. As a legislator I would help with whatever options that are there. I don't know um, what that would be right now, but I'd have to look into that a little bit more. I, I, I think when you look back, uh, you know, when I was starting off in the legislature, uh, Senator Mike Baumgartner had this great idea that to freeze the cost of t fit tuition and backfill that with state funding and then actually lower college tuition for the very first time. And uh, my daughter was a... Uh, student at WSU at the time and so we passed all this great re legislation to do that and yet my daughter's cost of going to college went up and so I asked her where where's are the increases coming from and she says well we we're required to pay these fees and those have gone up, gone up uh, over 50 percent just since last year and so that decimated the whole idea of low, freezing and then lowering college tuition. So I, I don't think the legislature uh, has a really a, a great answer to that unless they're willing to hold colleges accountable. And both Eastern and Central have been really good about how they use their money. And I think they're a model for all the rest of our colleges in the state uh, because they they truly believe that it's 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 the students money it's not their money and they're trying to find all kinds of different ways to make college education less expensive and it shows in how much it costs to go to college in those places so I think that could be a great model for uh, for for them because I, I think if we put it on the colleges to make sure that costs go down, uh, we're in a lot better shape than try to legislate it. Follow? I love that idea. I think transparency and, and putting the liability on with the, with the colleges is really where it needs to be because they need to be transparent on what they're charging at, for these students to be able to go get an education. Uh, I think that's a terrific idea. All right, on to another question then. The, uh, the number $7 billion is being kicked around, as you know, as projected shortfall in the next few years for the state of Washington. And the legislature, obviously, is going to be required to try to find ways in which to close that, that gap. Your uh, political opponents on the other side of the aisle are going to bring up, as you know, something they've brought up many a time. It's time now for a state income tax. Uh, Representative McCaslin, what about that? Well, I've... 
when I ran for office the first time and I've supported this uh, same idea every single time I've run is that uh, the people have spoken time after time that we don't need nor should we ever have uh, state income tax and I think to hear the Democrats say that oh well then you could be like Idaho well no we couldn't be like Idaho because uh, the Republican Party isn't in charge uh, <laughs> like it is in Idaho and you can see some of those better programs uh, being followed there because they can actually pay, pass those. We have not been able to pass uh, consistent uh, financial policy and we hear moans and groans from the other side that this is such an inequitable way to tax. Well, I think the B&O tax is a indirect income tax. And I think when you put that kind of burden on companies, there, there are not going to be people who want to start their own businesses. And so the, the thing that I've been pushing, been pushing for over and over is to make sure that we have balanced budgets and that, again, if citizens are being required to, to make sacrifices, then state agencies should be asked to make sacrifices too. And because all we ever hear from state agencies is there's not enough money, there's not enough money. And I can use the uh, newly minted Department of Children, Youth and Families as an example of that. It's they, they wanted all of this power, they wanted to incorporate juvenile justice, the Children's Administration, along with uh, parts of DSH, D DSHS, and they've combined this into this mega, mega agency, and it's being all guided by what was used to be the Department of Early Learning, and it's, it's unmanageable. They're seeing all kinds of different things slip, slip through the cracks, and so it's been my job and Representative Tom Dent's job, who's our ranking member on that committee, to continue to hold them accountable for things that they say that they will do, but they don't do. And as a result, we've lost between three and 5,000 child cares in our state as a result of their policies. And they, they don't want a private sector in child care. And that's what we're facing in our state. And child care is, uh, is, is pretty important for parents who both need to work. Mike? So I oppose 100% uh, uh, income tax. I think we're overtaxed as it is. I agree with the B&O tax is outrageous. Um, I, you know, I think this state has a problem with spending a lot more than uh, in revenue. Uh, obviously, the coronavirus is the exception uh, with less revenue because they shut down the economy. But to me, I think that if you, you know, there's two things you look at. The problem with government is they're a third party payer. And if you were to go out and buy a car and uh, you decided you, you like this type of car, you would spend, you would, two things you would worry about qual uh, quality of the car, and the second principle would be price. You'd be worried about how much does it cost? And then how much, what kind of quality you're getting for that cost. The problem with government is they're spending other people's money to be able to, and, and then they go and buy things that they're never going to consume. So they don't care about the price and they don't care about the quality. And because the government keeps moving, you get new people in, move, nobody ever owns it. So there always is going to be government waste. There's, I think there's plenty of revenue, but if we could control the waste, I think that we would be able to resolve the, the deficit. Uh, and there's a lot of other pieces and uh, verticals that we could focus on to be able to help with that. But income tax, I believe, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's a constitutional issue in the state of Washington because Seattle tried to pass a tax and they said that it became an income tax. Uh, the Seattle City Council is very, very liberal and they tried to pass a, a, a tax for over Amazon or anybody over 500 employees. I can't remember what exactly it was, but they considered it an income tax and they continue to try to implement that. You know, there's a lot of reasons not to be in the state of Washington because there's so many taxes. People flee this state. You don't need to add one more 
to the to the table of why you don't want to live in the Washington State. We want to be inviting. We want to bring as many businesses as we can to the table because businesses create revenue. Revenue then is tax. Taxed is then pays for these services that the government uh, uses. Uh, so that's kind of what I that's what I think about it. All right, follow up from you then. Well, I, I, I think just the, you know, when you talk about how efficient government agencies are, um, one of the things that we had problems with over the last couple of years is, is we have families who are in crisis and the social worker is trying to help them and get things to them. Uh, for instance, if, if both parents or the only parent has lost their job, uh, they might have problems getting these these things that, you know, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families wants to make sure they get. And it was only until it was, a, you know, the average time that a, that a social worker could get these things to that family was three weeks. And so Empire Health came in and said, listen, why don't you let us have be in charge of this. We have an empty warehouse. We'll fill it full of child seats, uh, diapers, formula, all those things that you know those those family needs, and we can guarantee delivery within 48 hours. So they did that, and wow, what a difference! It, w it was a huge difference, and it it just shows you that if government is willing to give up some of what they do to the private sector it usually runs better so that's that in my mind encap encapsulates this whole idea that we don't need a an income tax what we need is for the state to give up more and more of the things they've taken over and ruined all right on to another subject then uh, mike conrad do you agree with the growing um, din, if you will, the growing call across the nation for the defunding of police departments? Is that even a viable option among law enforcement agencies in Washington State? It is not. In fact, the fact that it is on the table is ludicrous. And to me, it's not defunding, it's defending the police department. To me, you must defend these guys. These guys have families. These guys are out there putting their lives in danger to protect us and to enforce the laws. And I think a lot of these police uh, departments are not being backed up by their govern government officials. The, the mayor of Seattle uh, didn't do anything about CHOP until the the people went to their her house and sat on her yard and then all of a sudden she was uh, uh this is crazy we need to fix this i mean she changed her mind immediately and then cleared it out to me that is not leadership that is not someone who is protecting the their constituents it's not someone who is doing what's right for their people it is someone who is political and only cares about politics and cares about cancel culture and cares about what people, uh, what their side thinks. And to me, um, I think you must defend the, the police department. These guys are great guys. Nobody is 100%. And if anybody watching this thinks they're 100%, you're wrong. And here's the thing. We all make mistakes, and there's always a bad apple in any institution, in any family, in any whatever organization. So yes, they're gonna be bad cops, but these cops are the professionals. I'm not a cop, I'm not a doctor. I don't know the answers to all these questions, but I do have common sense. And to me, if you back up your police department, they're gonna be the ones who are gonna show up when there's a problem, and if you don't, back them up and you defund them which is just crazy and to me if the liberal cities want to try it out i'm happy to let them do that we're not going to do that here in spokane we have an amazing sheriff who is uh backed up by the constituents i think he won by 76 percent um and i believe that we should always defend and not defund all right bob mccaslin well i i most certainly have to agree it's I, I have a lot of friends who are in law enforcement and I often have coffee with them at the lo local coffee shop and uh, they've 
they continually as I've, I've had some of some of their kids uh, uh, had the privilege to teach them and uh, it's it's interesting to see what they're dealing with every day uh, and I would say that 99.9 percent .9 of all of them are just really good people they've made sacrifices they put their lines their lives on the line every single day and as a result we should be supporting them all that much more uh, we know that in the next legislative session there's going to be uh, a huge rush to defund law enforcement in our state by the legislature and uh, I don't think it's in their it's in the legislature's power to do that but that's never held them back in the past so I think we really have to be on the watch to make sure that uh, they they remember you know we have state patrol in the state capitol who protect us every single day and i make sure every every day i walk into the capitol building that i thank them for their service and thank them for the sacrifices they make every day it's a dangerous job it's not a a job that people go into because they think oh this this is just going to be easy and I won't have to work very hard and I'll never face any danger. Oh, good grief. It's, it's the exact opposite of that. And we need to spend so much of our effort supporting them and let, letting people know why. Because I, you know, in today's culture, when it's okay to riot and pillage in public, but it's not okay to walk without a mask, I mean, what's our culture coming to? Uh, we need voices of reason speaking about this and, and doing it often and effectively. And that's what I plan on continuing to do. Follow up? Yeah, I just want the uh, law enforcement to know that I 100% support you. Um, I do understand that there are some bad apples and they are in every, every, every organization, and, but you can't i remember uh back when um 9 11 happened you know they came out really quick does not condemn all the muslims because muslims destroyed the twin towers and they said if you do that it, you know it, that that's wrong because not all muslims did that well it's the same thing with the police department you can't condemn all the police because a few people did a bad thing and i it is bad and no one should ever lose their life because of that but it happens, and uh, but you can't condemn the whole organization, the whole concept, the whole idea, because of a few bad apples. So, okay, on to a different uh, subject then, uh, uh, and this question is uh, for you, Bob McCaslin. Many uh, states are grappling with whether or not to reopen schools this fall, and uh, many study studies are now showing that school-aged children, K through 12, uh, children actually do not catch COVID-19 all that readily and that they are mm -hmm. unlikely to be carriers of this disease, thus facing a little bit of risk, but not very much if they were to return to in-person uh, instruction in the classroom. The American um, Pediatric Society just within the last few days came out with a statement that says the children will suffer psychological harm worse than the harm they would suffer from the pandemic if they were to remain at home this fall. Do you think that, it, uh, that Washington schools should reopen in September? Oh, absolutely. I, I believe they should. And uh, I, we had a, uh, during the time that I taught, we had, we had f uh, flu problems and uh, we, had, we had kids who who wound up in the hospital because of that and yet there wasn't the same level of panic that there is now I think we can we could even do this in a, a graduated way and at least that's what uh, we've been talking about as far as the education committee we've we're talking about uh, half of the kids coming in the morning and then in the afternoon going to an online format and then the opposite with the other half of the kids. I, I honestly think it'd be so much better just to send all the kids 
to school. And uh, if there are pre-existing uh, <coughs> medical conditions, uh, we have all kinds of things in place uh, already for that. And so I think we can reopen our schools safely. I think it's really the only way for schools to get their full funding is to be able to open. So it makes sense to me that we actually do that and that we help the public regain their confidence in our public education system. And I think uh, our charter schools have helped toward that quite a bit, but there's still a lot of, of parents that will not send their kids to public school. And uh, I think it could get even worse if we don't do this, if we don't, we're, we'll lose more parents you know, to the private sector, which I don't think is necessarily bad. Let me make that very clear. But I think if our public schools are to survive, they need to be able to open in September or, or even earlier to get a little head start on this. I think they can do it healthy. Uh, my wife works at kinder care and they take the temperature of kids. It's, it's not a huge time waster. Uh, take the temperature of kids. Um, make sure that kids are coming in healthy and then they take their temperature when they leave. It's the same for all the workers. It's, it's, it's not brain surgery here. I think it's a, it's a simple thing to be able to do. And I think because of the, governor, the governor's proclamations, there's this sense of panic. And, and, I, and I know people who are uh, classroom aides, people who work out on the playground, uh, bus drivers, custodians, cooks, they, they all want to open on time. Um, teachers union hasn't been as vocal as they, as they should, should be on this. And it's only because they bought in to the p sense of panic that the governor has sown, unfortunately. Mr. Conrad? Can you restate the question? Yeah, but should we reopen schools in the fall, given the data that we now know about what effect it would have on students, uh, medically speaking, it's minimal. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, is it time to, to uh, commit I, to doing that? Yeah, I absolutely think the schools should open. You know, it's funny. Um, they let out prisoners uh, in prison because of coronavirus when the answer was just wear a mask, right? Well, just give all the kids masks. Isn't that the answer? Um, I think there's a lot of double standard here. I think that uh, there's a lot of... Um, issues that are going to occur just as you said the psychologically i've actually seen that younger people are more paranoid about this than the older people and the older people are more susceptible to the coronavirus but i think it's because we've been around longer and we've seen a lot of other uh, garbage out there where people say things and we're not saying that I'm not saying that coronavirus isn't real. I'm saying if you take 500,000 deaths and you divide it by 7 billion people on this earth, it's not a big number. So to me, I don't think it's an issue. I think the kids need to go to school. I think there needs to be normalcy out there. I think people need to get back into life. Now, we need to be safe as much as we can, but to me, life has to go on and we can't sit and wait and wait and wait because it's going to create more issues that we don't even know about uh that are side effects to us not being out there and being social and being uh you know be able to go to school and be with friends and just that aspect of it is uh detrimental to our society follow up mr Picasso. yeah i agree it's we're i, I remember as a little kid my, my parents teaching me how to wash my hands and sing the ABC song. <laughs> and I find myself doing that every, every time, uh, you know, before I leave the bathroom, I, I'm washing my A, B, C, D, E. Well, I know it sounds silly and it probably looks silly too, but it's, it's it really, it's, this is not a tough thing. It, it's, it's uh, and, and I think, all the people that are involved, you know, with schools, I know the superintendents are saying, please, we, we really do want to open on time. And uh, we have some great school districts in the 4th District, uh, West Valley, Central Valley, East Valley. And 
They have great leaders. They, they have p people who have a calm head, who uh, know how to lead and know how to set an example uh, for everybody. And in the fourth district, the school districts are our largest employers. Let's not forget that. So we need to make sure that those people can go back to work. They can do it safely. All right. Anyone watching this uh, conversation would have to ask themselves, I'm sure, what separates these two guys? They sound like they're <laughs> carbon copies of each other in terms of their own philosophies. So, Mike Conrad, I ask you this question. Why are you running against McCaslin when basically you're saying the same things he's saying? So I have nothing against Bob. Uh, I think Bob's a great guy. I really I don't know Bob that well, but he seems like well-mannered, <laughs> nice guy. I don't think he has any uh, malice in him. But what I'm running, I'm not even running trying to, to beat Bob for the, any of those personal reasons. I'm running because I want to represent the small businesses in this 4th District. I want to make sure that through this hard time of this pandemic that um, small businesses are going to be able to recover without uh, these government agencies condemning them because there are all these departments, Department of Revenue, Department of Finance, Department of Labor and Industries, who could hamper that ability for these small businesses to be able to uh, thrive. Um, I think there is there are probably a lot of um, God complexes of some of these people who work for these state agencies just like Governor Ensley, you know, he, he thinks he's the king and he's not. So I want to be that person. I also believe that I can bring new energy into uh, this district. I think there's been a lot of um, same old, same old, same old, you know, with the past uh, leadership in this district. And I want to bring something new. I just want you to know that as a representative, I will be available uh, I will help you in any way that you need. If you have issues, whether it's a le legal issue, um, it's an issue with a law or some regulation, um, I'm all in about deregulating uh, these different rules for companies and businesses. I want to make the 4th District a place where businesses want to come and, and can be represented by me. So I, I think that outside of that, I mean, we have a lot of core values that are the same, but um, I think that I can bring a new energy and, and, and trim as much fat in there <laughs> that we can, which is sort of my tagline because I sell me. <laughs> Bob McCaslin, have you been able to identify significant differences between you and Mr. Conrad? Well, I, I don't think there's huge differences. I think I, I can bring a, uh, a familiarity with the legislative process, also the relationships that I have with uh, other Republicans and with Democrats across the aisle. I've, I do have even though we disagree horribly on so many different things, uh, Democrats at, doesn't keep me from treating uh, those people with respect. They have won an election to represent their district, and uh, their districts often want different things than the 4th District wants. But I always try to let them know, listen, you cannot, there's n I'm not making deals so that you can get what you want and I on the transportation committee I had a road preservation and maintenance bill which was actually heavily supported by our director of at, at WASDOT here in Spokane Mike Gribner and uh, representative Richelli who's also um, on that committee from the third district uh, he hated my bill because it, it kind of got in the way of his bill, which said that every uh, transportation project has to be looked at through a health lens. And, you know, I asked him, what does that mean? And, oh, it means a whole an encyclopedia full of things that could get in the way of us building and maintaining roads. And so, uh, and he offered to allow me to have a statement from my bill in his. And I said, no, I, I, I can't support your bill at all. And it's, you know, 
no disrespect, but I, it's, it's terrible policy, and it's just going to increase the cost of every project we ever do. And, and I think me speaking against that in that committee and on the House floor had a huge reason why it, it, it did come up for a vote. So I think there's, I, I understand that process. I, I, I believe I'm good at my job and I'm always looking for ways to improve. And so I think because I'm a lifelong learner, it's, it's something that I can do at least for the next two years. Uh, before those two years are over, my wife and I'll be reevaluating again whether I should run again. And uh, our, our marriage is very important to both of us, and she makes all kinds of sacrifices when I have to go over to Olympia, and that's why I come home every weekend. And, but uh, I, I do know that what's most important for me is for me to serve my constituents, most of which are retired and are on fixed incomes. And so they can't afford uh, increases in taxes. They can't afford uh, to be able to change their whole life because the legislature decides that they need to pay more for something. So I've been a consistent stand against that every single time, and my voting record shows it. So that's why I think uh, I'm the man for the job at the present time. Thank you. Gentlemen, we have run out of time. I appreciate your uh, responses, uh, Bob McCaslin, Mike Conrad. And, of course, we appreciate you watching. I'm Mike Fitzsimmons. Thanks very much for joining us.